topic today. This is sort of a very different thing from anything we've been doing in the class so far. The topic today is vector spaces. So the name of this course is Linear Algebra. And probably most um, of you don't really have any conception of what a mathematician means when that mathematician talks about algebra, because it's, it's of course very different from the college algebra that we have our freshmen do. When we talk about algebra, I would define algebra to be the mathematics of structure. The key observation sort of underlining the field of algebra is that in mathematics, you have all of these objects that look differently and yet act in a very similar way. Like you can have two by two matrices and you can have the real valued function. And on the face of it, these things are very different objects, but you can multiply matrices by scalars to get to make new matrices. And you can multiply functions by scalars to get to new functions. And you can add matrices to get new matrices. And you can add functions to get new functions. And with matrices, this multiplication distributes over addition. And with functions, this multiplication distributes over addition. So you have these objects that look like they should be completely different and should therefore have different properties, but somehow they have all of these properties in common and they have other properties in common as well. And an algebraist would look at this and say, well, these objects might look different, but they have the same structure underlying them, and that structure is causing them to have all of these properties in common. We are now going to justify the title of this course by introducing a mathematical structure, an algebraic structure. Sure. We are going to introduce the concept of a vector space. So a vector space is a set of something a set of numbers, a set of matrices, a set of functions, a set of something. 
thing of objects we'll call V here. And this set is going to have two operations defined on it. It's going to have addition defined on it, so that if U is in V and W is in V, we can add those things together. And it's going to have an operation called scalar multiplication. And scalar multiplication is going to take vectors, it's going to take elements of V. And it's going to multiply them by real numbers. And you'll notice for these, um, the elements of this set are called vectors, but I think it's, don't think we'd normally have the, the little arrow notation anymore. I think those are pretty much reserved for column vectors. And to be a vector space, um, this addition and this scalar multiplication has to satisfy some properties. Let's put on this board the first, let me maybe call this property zero. The first property that this set with this operation has to satisfy to be a vector space is called closure. So over here, I said that U plus W has to be defined and here I said that alpha times U has to be defined. Well, it has to be more than defined. In both cases, it has to belong to the vector space. And we call this property closure. I mean, the intuition, I guess, is you've got a room and the room has a door in it and you move around the room via addition and via scalar multiplication and the door is closed so you can't get out of the room. So as a quick example of something that's not a vector space, in fact, two things that aren't vector spaces, the set of rational numbers is not a vector space. And the set of rational numbers fails one of the closure conditions. One is rational. If we multiply one by pi, the result is not rational. So we're in our room with our door. Here's one inside the room, one is rational. 
we multiply it by pi and we get taken outside of this set. So it's not closed. Similarly, the irrational numbers are not a vector space. Um, pi is an irrational number and negative pi is also an irrational number. But if you add them, you get zero, which is a rational number. So once again, if you think of this as sort of a room, you've got pi and you've got negative pi. Come on, work with me. Sorry, I uh, not being very cooperative. You've got pi in here and you've got negative pi in here. And if you add them, you can escape from this room. So it's not closed. What other properties do vector spaces have to have? Well, the list I'm going to put on the board is going to be eight properties and there are going to be eight properties that we have seen twice already. Addition has to be commutative. Addition has to be associative. There has to exist a zero vector such that anything plus that zero vector is unchanged. For every V, every vector, there must be another vector called negative V, such that V plus negative V equals the zero vector. Scalar multiplication has to distribute over addition and see again scale their multiplication must distribute over addition it has to distribute said we didn't, well, using whether it's normal or not, having these bars will stop us from being confused about what's a scalar and what's a vector. 
character, kind of just writing those by instinct at this point. But anyway, what I was saying is that this distribution occurs, whether we're adding the vectors or whether we're adding the scalars. Scalar multiplication is associative. Associative. So if we've got two scalars like that, we can move the parentheses around and it doesn't change anything. Finally, scale their multiplication by one doesn't change a vector. And um, we've seen this this debate properties twice already. We saw it when we were talking about vectors. We saw it when we were talking about matrices. So the way we can now phrase that is by saying that R n is a vector space. And M sub P comma Q. This is no not standard notation. It's just something I came up with on the spur of the moment. But the set of all the P by Q matrices. is a vector space. But we can also have vector spaces that are nothing like those. I mean, going back, going back, to the first example I gave when I was discussing the concept of algebra. The set of all real valued functions is a vector space. By a real valued functions, I'm talking about functions whose domain is R, and whose codomain is also R. So even though these three objects, especially the last object, may look very different, they're all vector spaces. And there are things we can talk about in relationship to all three of those functions. Proving that something is a vector space is an extremely monotonous process. We just go through, we check closure first of all, and then we check all of these properties. So we're not going maybe to do that a lot in this class, but let's, um, let's at least investigate this statement. 
I've said that the set of all real valued functions is a vector space. Why is that? So we define, first of all, we define addition of functions in the natural way. If we have a function f and we have a function g, we can define a function f plus g. And f plus g of x is defined to be f of x plus g of x. And similarly, scalar multiplication, we can define alpha f in the natural way. Alpha f applied to x is alpha times f of x. And um, basically all of these eight properties, or at least a lot of them, are going to be kind of inherited from the real numbers. Let me just talk about this first property, that f plus g is supposed to be a g plus f. Um, I guess I sort of skimmed past this a bit. We've, we've demonstrated closure on this frame. I mean, we've defined the sum of a function, and if f is real and g is real, then f plus g is real. So f plus g is a real valued function. Similarly, if f of x is a real number, alpha times f of x is a real number. So alpha f is a real valued function. So basically just by defining addition and scale their multiplication, we get Closure. Addition. Is addition commutative? What's it even mean for two functions to be equal? Well, what it means for two functions to be equal is that When you take these two functions and apply them to an input k, you always get the same thing. f plus g equals g plus f if for every input k, f plus g applied to k equals g plus f applied to k. And now f plus g applied to k is f of k, and we have g of k, and then g of k, plus f of k. And now you see what I mean when I said that these properties are kind of inherited from the real numbers. f of k and g of k are just real numbers. 
dollars. And it's absolutely true that this equality holds for real numbers. Real addition is commutative. So F plus G, we can get rid of that E, um, that question mark. F plus G does equal G plus F. And the rest of these, or a lot of these, are very similar. I mean, associativity is the same argument. This function equals this function. If this function applied to K, equals this function applied to k, and then you just get, you just use the fact that real numbers are associative. There exists a zero vector, the constant function f of x equals zero satisfies the requirements of a zero vector. Every vector has an additive inverse. Um, yes, the, the scalar product of negative one with f plus f is zero. And again, if I had a hankering to prove this formally, I'd say, okay, on the left, we have a function. On the right, we have a function. For these functions to be equal, then when we apply the left-hand function to K and we apply the right-hand function to K, the result, this is, this is, um, maybe this notation is a little awkward. Let's, let's call that zero of X. Um, so this function on the left applied to K should equal this function on the right applied to K, or this function on the left applied to K is negative one times F of K plus F of K. The function on the right applied to K is zero. So this is a true statement. I mean, you prove all of these just by kind of going to the real numbers. Why is zero defined this way? Again, you just go to the real numbers. Commutativity, associativity, one times a function equals the function. Once again, all of these are true because these are properties that the real numbers have. I'm just, if you want to prove this, we want to prove that one times F equals F. That's the same as saying that for any K, one times F of K equals F of K. And now this is just a true statement. F of K is a real number, one times a real number is that real number. So, I mean, I didn't I, be sort of tedious going through all eight of these. I just wanted to sort of give a taste of what these arguments that something is a vector 
vector space might look like. Let's now give, actually, let's give a few more examples of vector spaces. Or let's give at least one more example because we're going to use this a few times in this class. P sub n is the set of polynomials of degree less than or equal to n. And we're going to explicitly include the zero function. Um, this is just, this is kind of a technicality. Um, whether, whether or not the polynomial P of X equals zero has a degree is something that people don't quite seem to agree with. Some people say like it has a degree of negative infinity. That say other people will just say it doesn't have a degree it's the only polynomial without a degree and the reason people are the reason we have this kind of debate is that like ordinarily you know you do stuff like x squared plus x times x plus one. This is degree two, this is degree one, the degree of their product is three. So ordinarily, the degree of a product is just the sum of the degrees. The zero polynomial is the only case where that breaks down. This is degree one. Who knows what that degree should be? But this product is also the zero polynomial. So it's just because the zero polynomial doesn't act the way other polynomials do that this issue kind of crops up. And I'm just saying, I don't, I don't care about this. You can say that its degree doesn't exist. You can say that its degree is negative infinity, whatever. I'm including it in this set. So that's kind of why this uh, set is specially defined in this way. And this is a vector space. Um, it's closed is the main thing. Um, well, I shouldn't say the main thing. It has, of course, to satisfy all eight of these conditions, but it also has to be closed and it does satisfy closure. If you have two polynomials, a degree n polynomial and a degree m polynomial, let's not use n, let's use k. 
and you add them, then the degree of the sum is the maximum of these two degrees. So if both of these polynomials are in P sub N, then both of these degrees are less than or equal to N, and the maximum is less than or equal to N. And likewise, if we have a polynomial in P sub N, and we multiply it by a scalar, ordinarily, ordinarily that doesn't change the degree. The degree is still K. The only exception to that is if that scalar happens to be zero. But if the scalar is zero, then this product is the zero polynomial. And we've included that by special fiat. So it doesn't hurt anything. So what about the other eight properties? We actually do not have to have most of them. Or rather, let me try that sentence again. We're going to get most of the properties automatically. And the key observation here, and this is going to be our next major observation, is that this set. of polynomials lives inside the set of real valued functions. Every polynomial is a real valued function. And we've the, oh, she'll have to wait. Every polynomial is a set of real valued functions. Ah, sorry, this uh, <laughs> disrupted my flow. Every polynomial is a real valued function. So you ask a question like, Do polynomials have this property? Are polynomials commutative? Well, we've already decided that the set of real valued functions is a vector space. So in fact, every two functions have this property. Therefore, certainly polynomials satisfy it. Every three functions have this associativity property. Therefore, certainly polynomials do. This I'll come back to. Every function has an additive inverse. Therefore, polynomials do. Every function has these distribution properties. Therefore, polynomials do. Every function times one is that function. Therefore, polynomials have that property. So the set of polynomials inherits practically all of the vector space conditions from the fact that it's living inside a vector space. The only conditions it doesn't 
inherit our closure, first of all. And it doesn't inherit this property three. There exists a zero function, but there's no inherent reason to suppose that that zero function is a polynomial. The zero function exists, but there's no inherent reason to suppose that it's included in this set. Except, of course, it is because we've explicitly included it in this set. And that is going to be our next major definition. A sub space of a vector space is a subset of the vector space that is or that one is closed. And I mean closed in both ways, closed under addition, Closed under scalar multiplication and two contains the zero vector. And as you might expect from the name, Subspaces are vector spaces. So P sub N is a sub space of the set of real valued functions. Um, you can consider P sub N as its own thing though. I mean, you can think of P sub N as just existing by itself and not think about the rest of the real valued functions. Sort of, I guess, like how in sort of other mathematics, the real numbers are a subset of the complex numbers, but also we just think of the real numbers as being their own thing and don't worry about the complex numbers all the time. Just because P sub N is a subspace of a bigger vector space doesn't mean we can't think of P sub N as just being its own thing. Um, another example. So from calculus, the set of continuous real value 
functions is a vector space. More specifically, the set of continuous real valued functions is another subspace of the set of real valued functions. That this is closed is just calculate this. The sum of two continuous functions is continuous. The product of two continuous functions is continuous and constant functions are continuous or go a constant times a continuous function is continuous and then i guess also from calculus the zero function f of x equals zero is continuous. I mean, f of x equals any constant would be continuous. Again, that's a calculus exercise. So we have spaces, we have subspaces, which are also vector spaces. I guess to wrap up today, we'll end a little early, but that will keep us synchronized with our online students. We'll make the observation that all vector Spaces have some sort of generic sub spaces. So every vector space has sub spaces. Not all of them are very interesting. If you have a vector space V, V is a subspace of itself, big deal. And the set containing the zero vector and only the zero vector is also a subspace. Well, again, big deal. Um, a more interesting example of a subspace that every vector space has is the spans of vectors. See, and this is a good example of the power of algebra. We defined spans in the specific context of vectors, but vectors are just an example of vector spaces. And now we can take this definition that we looked at for one vector space and expand it to every vector space. And the definition of the span is the same for vector spaces as it was 
for Rn, say you have a bunch of vectors V sub one to V sub N. Then the span of V sub one up to V sub N is the set of all their linear combinations. So here are these A sub I run over all of the real numbers. So just, I mean, it's the quickest of examples in, in the vector space of continuous functions, you can define the span of the sine and the cosine. And this gives you all functions of the form some constant times the sine plus some other constant times the cosine. And C1 and C2 run over all of the real numbers. So have a little moment. So let's see if Let's see if uh, why does this have to be so difficult? Let's see if we can take a look at these functions. Let's see, new share, Desmos. I don't know if Desmos is going to line. C sub, oh, it likes it fine. C sub one times the sine of X plus C sub two times the cosine of X. And you just, these C's can be any real numbers and different values of C obviously are giving you different functions. And every combination of C1 and C2 is in this vector space. It's a vector space because it's a subspace and all subspaces are vector spaces. And with that, I will see it's Thursday. So this is the end of the week. I'll get some review for you to look at out as far as the test goes. I'll try to do that. It'll probably be tomorrow, maybe today, probably tomorrow. We can answer any questions you have about it on Tuesday, test Thursday.